This conference will now be recorded. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Speaker Series of the Spirit of Adventure Council. Today is April 28th, and today we have Bob Higgins, who's the founder and managing partner of Causeway Media Partners. He has more than 30 years of experience in venture capital and has served as a director of many public and private companies. Currently, he's an advisor to Navamed Capital and Waterline Ventures. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Bob Higgins, how are you today? Hi, Chuck. Thank you. Thanks. So could you tell us a little about yourself and, um, and, and what you're doing? Sure. Uh, why don't I jump right in on what uh, Causeway is, because maybe everybody will quickly relate to that. Uh, sure. Everybody likes sports. So uh, um, I, I uh, will, will tell, say a little bit about how I got into venture capital at some point and other things I've done in my career that are quite different from business. But um, uh, right now, I am one of three partners in a venture capital firm, meaning a firm that invests in young ventures. We have capital for young ventures, and um, everything we do is somewhat sports related. So it could be uh, sports technology, um, sports ticketing, uh, so-called sports content. So an example of some companies that might ring a bell uh, would be uh, Formula E, which is an all-electric racing series um, that we were uh, the first investors in. If you've ever bought tickets, SeatGeek, that's one of our companies. Uh, and uh, But we have companies that cover sports on streaming video, with companies like Flow Sports, and, uh, uh, and we're also investors in a, uh, in, a, uh, street in a skateboarding company that's uh, actually kind of a disappointing this spring because their format was going to be the format used as skateboarding was introduced to the Olympics this summer. So oh. it's a, a little bit of a bummer. But one of our superstars is featured in this week's Sports Illustrated, so you might check him out. Uh, anyway, that's uh, that's what Causeway is. And and so stepping back a little bit, um, um, uh, I, I'll talk a little bit about me, and then I'll come back to what venture capital is, because I think it's an interesting space not only to understand who the people are who invest in young companies, but what their relationship is with entrepreneurs. And entrepreneurship, in my opinion, is the driving force in our economy uh, over the last three decades and will be going forward, particularly for your generation. So my, just a quick background on me. I'm a kid from Melrose, Massachusetts. All right. Um, went to St. Mary's Grammar School, Malden Catholic High School. But I went to Harvard College, and then I went to Harvard Business School to get an MBA. Harvard College gives bachelor degrees. Uh, uh, Harvard Business School um, gives master uh, the MBA degree. Uh, while I was in college, I did many different things. Always had part-time jobs, but was a varsity hockey player. I was a hockey goalie, as a matter of fact. Uh, so, uh, um, and played a little semi-pro hockey after that. I wasn't very good, but nonetheless, they they used to let me play. Anyway, the uh, <laughs> Um, uh, after business school, um, it was the end of the Vietnam War, and I needed to serve in the Army, and uh, I had done a bunch of things, so I got a great assignment at West Point, where I worked in the, as an assistant director of admissions at West Point as a lieutenant in the U.S. Army. I had done ROTC in college. From there, I went to Washington, uh, and uh, what I'm going to do is divide this up in just a couple of minutes, though, three big categories of things that I think are exciting and you may want to ask about it. I worked in government, working as an assistant to some very senior people, meaning I was at the White House on a regular basis. Second, I got involved uh, in the nonprofit sector, went to New York and was at three different private foundations. Um, so that's another whole world, government, nonprofit, and then um, ended up finding my way into venture capital as that furled that whole field was emerging in the 80s. Founded a firm called Highland Capital uh, and uh, then founded Causeway Media Partners. And finally, for 20 years, I've been a professor at Harvard Business School where I teach about entrepreneurship and venture capital. So um, coming back to what I'm doing now, uh, Causeway is kind of fun. You'll get a kick out of this. I was, um, I had left my firm that I founded with the intention of teaching, advising my old firm, doing a little investing, when one of my former partners called me and said, we need to talk. Um, he had left Highland to be to buy the Boston Celtics. And he's wow. the principal owner and CEO. His name is Wick Grosbeck. You'll see him under the basket. Well, he just moved his seats to the center court, actually. But for years, he sat under the basket. So 
he's the guy who bought it in 05 and won the world championship in 08. Wick had worked with me at Highland and called and said, let's do some investing in sports. Uh, and he said, he reminded me that a third friend of ours was available to possibly join us. That third friend was in venture capital, but he had parlayed some of his activities into buying a piece of the San Francisco 49ers. Wow. So the three of us went out and raised a fund of money to invest in sports stuff. And uh, at the very beginning, I mentioned some of the things that we've done like Formula E or SeatGeek. Um, if you have involved in youth sports, I know my kids uh, are a little bit involved in golf, a little bit in baseball, a little bit in skiing. And guess who is the organizing software for all of them? A company called Sports Engine. That's an example of one of my investments. I sat on its board of directors, helped this young team build their software company. And they now have 25 million young athletes who use them for not only registration, but also for game management. It helps the coaches communicate with the parents and the kids, and they collect all the fees and dues and whatnot uh, for, and they do the background checks on coaches, et cetera. So it's a pretty cool company, and it takes a huge load off the backs of volunteers. So Sports Engine would be another example of the kind of stuff that we do at Causeway. Then maybe just a word, Chuck, if you think it'd be helpful on what you do day to day if you're in venture capital. So we have a nice office in Harvard Square and um, we have, I have a few junior people who work with me. And what we really do, we're out all looking all over the country, frankly, all over the world for interesting companies um, that are young, that are looking for capital to grow. Um, we will invest quite a pretty sizable amount of money, anywhere from say $5 million to $20 million in a young company. Uh, and they might, uh, for example, if right now in this horrible situation we've got with COVID-19, mm -hmm. any companies are really hurting. But let me give you an example of one that's not hurting. Uh, I don't know, you'll, Take a look at sometimes at Freeletics. Freeletics, uh, which is really not free, uh, is an exercise company in Munich, Germany. Uh, they have coaches, trainers. Uh, you um, pay a subscription fee and they train the heck out of you. And that's a company that's actually doubled over the past month because so many people are desperate to exercise. So uh, another one of our companies allows you to ride your bike uh, and it's a company called Zwift, where you get to ride on your bike with your friends. And let's say you're in the US and you want to go for a bike ride with two friends in Australia and a few friends from France. Uh, you just all sign up to Zwift, you pick a course and you go out. And on your screen, there will be a, uh, um, uh, an avatar, be you, and there will be your friends on the road. And by the way, if they start pedaling really hard, you're going to see them disappear. Uh, but also, if you pull in behind them, your machine that your bike is on is so sensitive that you can actually draft behind them and you can feel the benefit. So that's Z-W-I-F-T. And all of the professional bikers use it for training. So I use Zwift and SeatGeek. By the way, there's a company that's really having a hard time, SeatGeek. They sell tickets to sports events uh, and to rock concerts. Guess what's not happening right now? Yes. Sports events <laughs> and rock concerts. Right. Yes. So if Zwift and Freeletics are doing better than normal, SeatGeek is having a really hard time. And uh, so it is a very difficult time. If you're a venture capitalist, you do really two things. You find good things to invest in, but even more fun is after you invest, you help them grow, you help them help the people who are the founders find people to hire, find more money to invest in their company, find the customers, uh, and, uh, and maybe someday help them find somebody to buy their company so that they can enjoy the benefits of what they did. A lot of these young companies eventually sell the company. Um, uh, they don't necessarily stay in for 30 or 40 years. So Apple or Google are almost the exception of tech companies that stayed independent. 
uh, the mass majority of even the successful ones uh, were sold. So anyway, I mostly have been involved the sports stuff. I can give you things that names that you might recognize. But prior to that, most of my investing in venture was in more technical stuff, companies that sell things to business or biotech companies or med tech companies. Um, and so very few, I'll, I'll tell you two that I was involved in that are consumer that really were successful. One I was involved early on in Staples and the other was something called Lululemon. And uh, we were the first investors in Lululemon. So both of those turned out, those were both deals that I found uh, and, uh, um, and uh, that wasn't really my expertise, consumer or retail, but uh, I, I mentioned those just because I, those are brand names that you may have heard of. So I don't know, Chuck, I could go on a bit more about that. No, this is great. We have a, a couple of questions yeah. for you. Yeah. Uh, so it, it's so cool and how originally you mentioned, you know, believing uh, in doing a lot of things. And, and I, I think the same way. And that's so entrepreneurial of you. Um, so we, we do have a couple of questions that are coming in. So you mentioned uh, tech before uh, sports that you were investing in. Have you ever invested in any other types of companies or do you stick to that uh, those two categories? It's uh, pretty much everything has been somewhat technology oriented. Okay. Um, the uh, Now, even the Staples investment, which is just retail, that doesn't sound like tech. I really helped them develop their internet presence. So I actually was on the a separate board of something called staples.com, which was their foray into e-commerce. So even that had a technology basis to it. But... Uh, but most of uh, uh, yeah, most of it has been technology. And initially in venture, my int my firm that I founded was interested in software, medical, and communications. So technology that touched on those three very large industries. So when you're going to look into an invest uh, or invest in something or, or a company, how do you know you have the right idea? Do you go by like a gut feeling or do you do a lot of research that leads up to that decision? Well, that's the beauty of spending, uh, you know, uh, uh, concentrating in an area. So, for example, I mentioned I invested in sports engine uh, in youth sports. Uh, I found that kind of on my own. I like the people. The space seemed interesting. Uh, it really took a year of researching the field, getting to know the people before we actually wrote the check. So this is not something, this is not like buying stock, you know, calling up Merrill Lynch and, and buying some <laughs> shares uh, because you like it one afternoon. Um, it takes months sometimes to get to know a space, do a deep dive in an area, go to the conferences in that space, see who the companies are, who the competitors are before settling in on the bet you want to place in, in there. But after investing in Sports Engine, I became even more knowledgeable. I sat on the board. So now I'm involved in several other companies that are in the youth sports space because I slowly gain more expertise. And I think that's true. You'll find that venture capitalists often tend to uh, pick a broad space, but then become more specialized over time based on the company's where they are board members. And frankly, based off a lot of where their winners are. They learn from where the good stuff is and they do more, not competitors, but related companies in that space. I have a good feeling that entrepreneurship has a lot of risks for sure. Um, what are some of the mistakes you've made along the way and what kind of advice would you give to uh, on other entrepreneurs or future entrepreneurs to avoid? Um, well, Almost everything I did that was a really good idea and everything that I did with that was a bad idea had something to do with people issues. Uh, yeah. It um, um, uh, uh, actually sometimes, uh, sadly, one of the things you do as a venture capitalist is you're, the, you're a large owner, you're a board member. I'm often chairman of the board. When it comes time, if a, if a founder or a CEO really isn't doing the job uh, and uh, you know, it's uh, just like Belichick. You've got to decide. Uh, yeah. I need I need a new guy in there at left tackle, or maybe a new guy in a quarterback. Uh, and uh, that's uh, that's the call that has to be made. Now, when you back somebody, just like a team, you want them to win. You're all in trying to help them win. 
but when it comes to the point where you need to make a change, you make a change. So usually the mistakes are not deciding, uh, making those decisions, either backing somebody who really is the wrong person in the first place, or staying with somebody who really isn't getting the job done, staying with them too long. And almost everything I did that was looked brilliant later was just simply because I did back somebody great and they made me look good by building a great organization. What would you say would be the most important skill that you need for this type of job? <laughs> well, you know, the you, it, it's important to have a lot of skills in venture. You can't know too much about finance. I mean, you need to know some accounting. You can't know too much about marketing. You can't know too much about manufacturing. You need to know all of these. But as I said earlier, it re really is gonna come down to the people issues. In fact, maybe I'll just give an example of a course I taught at Harvard Business School it was called the Entrepreneurial Manager. And it was taught in is a, the first the MBA program is two years. This mm -hmm. course is the last course to start in the required first year program. After they've had their marketing, their finance, their accounting, their operations management. And that's the course that is designed using entrepreneurship to pull all of the courses together and look at a whole organization, but look at a young organization. Uh, and, uh, and, and, I, and the one thing I learned from that course was that uh, a good venture capitalist can't know too much, but um, a good investor knows how, how to, to, that he, again, it's back to, I don't know why I came up with the Belichick analogy, but when Bill Belichick walks across the line onto the field to try to do something, it's a mistake. He's not a player. He's a coach. And knowing the line between that, uh, and you'll see sometimes young, enthusiastic coaches who try to get in there and they're too involved and they're too, and they're bo too bossy with the players. You need to be able to let people grow, make their own mistakes and know how to help them. And I think uh, whether it's a coach or a teacher, um, that, that's, I think, the skill set of a good venture capitalist. All right, um, let's say, because that's good advice for sure. What other, like what's one huge big piece of advice that you would give to somebody who is just starting out? Um, you know, I think that the best advice starting out or in mid-career or later in career is finding a mentor. Uh, and let me tell you what I mean by that. I, I certainly benefited from that myself. In organizations it's you know you go in you do your job you keep your head down you do what you're told to do but often when you're doing a good job somebody start takes has takes some notice in you and they offer to help and they might be fairly senior uh, and you know the, you've heard the expression brown nose you know you don't want to be somebody who's just <laughs> looking uh, for special favors but seeking that person out and if they've offered to help go to them ask questions, um, uh, offer to do additional work, uh, and you can, over time, build very strong relationships. And I think uh, senior managers want to help develop younger people, and I think it's a, a very healthy process. So I think it's important to be a mentor, even if you're 16 years old, it, you can be mentoring 10 or 12 year olds. Um, I watch, I have a 12 year old son, I watch him mentor kids three grades lower than, than, than he does a little tutoring, uh, math tutoring for kids. He's in the sixth grade. He does some tutoring for third graders. Wow. It's never too early to be a mentor and it's never too late to find mentors. Uh, now I'm an old dog and I still find people to help mentor me as I do new things um, like some of these areas, new areas that I get in, into in sports. Uh, I'm, uh, I will seek out people who can advise me. In some cases, they might even be younger than I am, but they really are a mentor to me uh, in that space. Did you have a favorite mentor when you were starting out? Somebody you could definitely rely on? Yeah, I, well, a lot. Um, I do remember, you know, I remember coaches uh, in hockey. I remember various people in school, but an, I had an early job in the U.S. government, in the U.S. Treasury, the guy who ran the whole international area for the treasury, uh, and his name was Jack, and uh, uh, and he uh, was 
very busy guy, he didn't have time to do this or that, but he sort of would always go out of his way to give good advice. I took it and I followed up. And when he, I left there, uh, he stayed in government for a while. Then he left to go work in New York for a finance company. And we stayed in touch and uh, he offered me a few jobs to go work for him. I never did. Wow. We stayed in touch. And I'll never forget when I started my own firm, uh, I called him up for advice. Uh, and uh, this is a true story. I was starting Highland Capital. I didn't know if it was a good idea or not. He was very busy. He was the chairman, chairman and CEO of a very big bank. And uh, I called him up and his assistant put me through and he took my call. He never called me Bob. He always called me by my last name. He said, Higgins, what do you want? <laughs> and I said, well, Jack, I'm thinking of starting a venture firm and uh, I'm trying to decide whether to do it or not. I'd love to get your advice. He said, I'm in a meeting. I don't have any time. You definitely should do it. And I'm in for $5 million. And he hung up the phone. <laughs> Wow. So that's a mentor. <laughs> yeah, that's a mentor. And then d definitely, uh, uh, well, did you always believe that you had that in you because he believed you? Uh, no, um, you know, <laughs> I, I, I went to, I went to talk to a lot of different people. I mean, I, I'm remember some of some friends gave me advice and they were more skeptical. Uh, you've got to believe in yourself, uh, most importantly, but, uh, it is good to listen. And if I go around to do something new, I, I'm, I'll probably touch base with 10 or 12 people. And if uh, four or five think it's a good idea, that's plenty. If you're looking for all 12 to think it's a good idea, it, by the way, if all 12 agree it's a good idea, it's probably a bad idea. It's probably too late. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably too late. Have you ever invested in a business that didn't go well? And then how did you, if so, like how did you cut ties or move from them? Sure. Well, uh, you know, I have uh, and a lot and probably, 10 or 20% of the things we invest in are uh, do poorly. They don't completely fail, but they do poorly. And, you, and, and our goal usually in those is to figure out a way. It's often a good technology or a pretty good idea, but then some, think about, uh, for example, I was involved in investing in a couple of different search engines. They did pretty well, Lycos, Ask Jeeves, all these things, if you were 20, <laughs> 10 years older, you'd remember them. And uh, then along came this really dumb idea called Google. Well, guess what happened to all these other search engines? So uh, what you needed to do, there was nothing, they weren't doing a bad job, but somebody came on with something, uh, you know, a better way to approach it. And, but we found a way to sell those companies. Uh, in one case, we actually made a little bit of money. Uh, in another case, we just lost a little bit of money. But I think knowing that you've got a problem and deciding, knowing when to, uh, what's that saying? Knowing when to hold them and knowing when to fold them. Uh, fold them. And, uh, yeah. I think he just died, you know, the, the guy who sang that song. But um, the, uh, uh, so I think that the, it, it, there is a way to, as the, I think the technical term is mitigate risk. And uh, when you have a problem, um, what's the other saying? The other say, old saying is if you're uh, 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 in a hole, stop digging and uh, so sometimes you know if you've got a problem and you're in a hole it's best to just try to get out of the hole stop digging you don't want to go in deeper what has been your greatest investment thus far or the coolest maybe um well the you know i've had one recently that was a big success um and that was um um a surgical robotics company. So it's not one anybody's ever heard of. Uh, and it's uh, it was acquired, actually it was bought by Johnson & Johnson for a huge amount of money. Um, but uh, I can't say too much about it, to be honest, but uh, that was a good example of a, of a big win. Uh, and it was an entrepreneur that I'd backed a couple of times before. That's another thing. Uh, uh, I think when you find a good person to back, you might do it over and over again. And this guy uh, has, built three or four very successful companies now. And, and ironically, he just now started his own venture capital firm to invest in entrepreneurs. And I'm, I'm now an investor in his firm. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm a, a so-called limited partner of that fund that he's created. So, uh, but I think that was a huge multiple uh, on our investment. Making three or four times your money is good. Making 50 or 100 times your money is really good. 
and uh, yeah. it does happen. It's not just uh, not just Facebook. <laughs> not just Facebook. All right. Did you always want to be an entrepreneur? Again, going back to saying how you you liked being involved in so many things. Did this like did you grow up saying you know I want to be an entrepreneur when I grow up, or or was it something you just kind of stumbled upon into? Uh, no, I really stumbled stumbled along. I mean, someone said to me, why did you go to business school versus other things like law school? And, you know, I went to business school because it's two years and the army <laughs> gave me a two year deferment. Yeah. I probably would have gone to get a Ph.D. or go to law school or who knows what. Uh, and uh, I didn't want to go to a one year program because I thought I'm in no hurry to go in the army. Uh, if they're going to send me to Vietnam, great, but I'm in I'm not in a rush to go. And uh, so um, it was uh, it's I think it's a lot of coincidences. I mean, right now, this virus is creating uh, amazing disruptions in people's lives. And I look back at almost everything that's happened to me that's great came through some disruptive process, some surprise. The army caused me to do one thing. Somebody I was working for who was terrific got fired and I now needed to go do something else. Um, so it's often uh, a uh, disruption that really creates opportunity. And I think figuring out how to, how, to, you know, how to look on the other side of that coin is the secret. And if you're going to be an entrepreneur or a venture capitalist, uh, you need to be optimistic. If you're not uh, optimistic, then uh, life is hard. Did you think, uh, was there any, any skill or um, maybe leadership foie poids from the army that kind of helped you throughout your, your business decision making moving forward? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I think I, I think well I, think I learned a lot in scouts. As a matter of fact, we didn't talk great. about that. Yeah. And uh, and I think that to me the army was grown up scouts. Uh, a lot of the same issues, a lot of discipline. Um, you know, sometimes being doing things you didn't quite understand why you were being asked to do something or why something was structured the way it was. Uh, and uh, but going along, you can stay a little skeptical. Uh, I always was, but um, but I always was supportive and uh, enthusiastic. And I think, yes, in the Army, I saw um, a lot of tough decisions. I was never actually under fire. I was never in combat. Like a lot of people learn from that. I was, you know, I told you I got assigned to work in the admissions office at West Point. Who knew? That was a pretty lucky assignment. But, um, but I, I think I did some pretty tough infantry training. And I did learn a lot of great lessons from that. And, and also what, what I really loved about the Army, you know, and it's again, similar to scouting. You don't pick who the kids are in your troop uh, and you've got to get along with each other. And in the Army, you get thrown together with people even more diverse uh, from all over the country. And, uh, and I think learning how to uh, work with other people, how to be a team is uh, incredibly valuable. Learning how to follow Learning how to lead it requires first learning how to follow. So say, uh, were you ever a position such as senior patrol leader or a high ranking uh, leadership position in the army in, in your in your group? Yeah, I was. It, uh, I was the, uh, I was, the, at, they made me actually company commander in my, uh, oh, in my right. training program. So, which was pretty good. Uh, a company is about 160 people. And uh, so, yeah, that was, a lot of responsibility but you're first you're in a squad that's about eight then you're in a platoon that's about typically 40 then a company is four platoons of about 160 ish and uh so yes i was in charge uh there and uh and i'll let me tell you one thing we did on the final day uh we decided one thing you don't do in the army is you don't mess with the army's stuff uh, and we were all had helmets, what they call helmet liners, the things you actually wear under the heavy helmet. And in training, you wear the helmet liner a lot. Well, I decided that on the final day of parade, we should paint our helmets so that we they'd be uniform. They, most of the helmets were all a little bit this color gray, a little green, this color green, old, new. So there were 25 companies, and I was the commander of one of them. And we marched out on the field and one company had glistening helmets. 
24 companies had the weird, funny, green company. <laughs> and it was very clear that the senior people were either going to hang me, they were going <laughs> to hate it or love it. So it was pretty risky. And, uh, and I, all of a sudden, I looked over and I could see the senior colonel uh, in charge of the whole thing was kind of looking over, nodding and smiling. And I knew we both pulled it off. But it was kind of a gutsy call, uh, and uh, we then won won the won that field day, and we came out the top company for the summer, which was kind of cool. All right, <laughs> well, congrats to that. That's but great. I could have gone to I, I also could have gone right to the stockade and been locked up <laughs> for destroying military equipment. <laughs> that's true. You mentioned that's it's funny. You mentioned uh, learning how to lead requires learning how to fall. Can you kind of expand on that? That's pretty good. Sure. I think it's important to know how to, you know, a lot of times you'll see a team and there'll be one person, one or two people who just don't really want to go along with the group. And somebody clearly has been put in charge and he or she may not really be great at rallying everybody. And I think knowing how to help that group be successful as part of the group and not immediately start questioning the leader, not trying to push your ideas even if you have much better ideas, figuring out how to do it and how to make them successful is, an, is incredibly valuable because teams get thrown together for various reasons. And if you learn to that, that and you have developed the empathy for, uh, for other people who are leaders or followers, uh, I think that, that helps you be a leader yourself someday. So if you're in a group that's kind of not doing great and you've got somebody in charge, that annoying kid uh, <laughs> from your classroom is now in charge of your group. Not a bad idea to figure out how to make him successful. It'll be a better lesson for you than it will be for him. Thank you. All right, so we're coming uh, to the end of our time. Is there any advice that you would give any young scouts or any young future entrepreneurs in general um, moving forward? Well, you know, uh, yeah, kind of in the, the only other maybe thing that I see big picture advice, and I say this now because I teach 80 MBAs in a classroom, uh, and they're all 25, 26, 27 years old. So I I kind of see people who are at a very key point in their careers, but they're not kids. And, uh, and, and in today's world, I've noticed how important it is. Uh, I already mentioned mentor, look, seek a mentor, but Another word that I you hear a lot of these days, and I think it's worth thinking about, especially if you're sort of under 16 or you know it's even under 21, and that's the word intern or internship. Uh, find ways to get exposed to people, to work for people. And an intern, sometimes you might work for free. You might volunteer your time, uh, uh, but and it might be a short experience, might be a couple of weeks somewhere. But being enthusiastic, taking on a tough job, but going somewhere to learn things. Uh, my daughter has a uh, a friend in the uh, um, in her class, and so she's 12 in sixth grade. And uh, uh, we drove by the fish market the other day. She said, "Oh, uh, so and so works in there." I, I said, "What? He, he's 12 years old. He can't work there." She said, "Oh no, he went in. He offered to help after school, and he now goes in there and works a few days a week." I don't even think they pay him, uh, but he's now learned how a little business works. It's a place to go. He was curious. He's learned a lot. He's now an expert on making the best New England chowder in the world, and um, uh, and it was a, a a lesson. So even at 12 years old, you know, uh, I don't, you know, a lot of businesses aren't supposed to hire you if you're under 16, uh, and it's hard to do it. But you'll see that people who are at Yale College who are sophomores are killing themselves to have the right summer job, the right internship, so that they can get into the right graduate school. And then they have an internship so they can get an offer from the best, whatever, consulting firm or bank. So, or if you're gonna to go to medical school, an internship at Mass General, you might just be emptying bedpans when you're young. <laughs> yeah. But doing it, doing learning at the lowest level, doing a good job, um, and uh, is really beneficial, and it will come back to pay it, pay a benefit over and over again. Thank you very much. That's great. Uh, we really appreciate you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. This is Bob Higgins.
Um, thanks again for doing this. This is very educational, and I'm sure the, uh, the, the kids who are working on merit badges will love this as well. I enjoyed it, Chuck. Sorry, we, I can't give you the Boy Scout handshake. Uh, no, that's I know, right? Well, we'll do it from afar, as instructed. That's great. <laughs> thank, okay. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.